The Great Houses hate each other. Theft, murder, assassinations, secret raids, standard stuff. The Prophet Veloth changed Tamriel forever when he led his people from the beauty of Somerset to the ashen jungles of Resdane, casting off the rigid laws and customs of the Aldmer. He did the unconventional and took heed from the Daedra, who showed him an alternative way, the way of the Kaima, the Changed Ones. With the guidance and protection of Azura, Mafala, and Boethia, the followers of Veloth made the arduous journey to a new home. But this exodus in itself was not enough to lay the foundations of the mighty Dunma society that would come. Mafala, the Daedric Prince of Lies, Sex and Murder, the Web Spinner, Teacher of the Secret Arts, she was the one who taught the Kaima how to organize themselves into a society of clans that would one day form the great houses of Morrowind. This was unprecedented, a nation built on the teachings of the Daedra, a nation free from the influence of the Aedra. It is no coincidence that the Myrrh of Morrowind became so distinct. What's up ladies and gentlemen, my name is Drew from Fudge Muppet and recently there have been many of you asking for a video on the Great Houses, so we have finally delivered. So do give the video a like if you're excited to get into some of that sweet sweet Dunma lore. But without any further ado, I present the Great Houses of Morrowind. So like I was saying, it was the Daedric Prince Mafala who was responsible for the societal organization of the Kaima. These family-based clans would, throughout the eras, evolve into the houses of Morrowind that we know today, with many non-related members in the form of hirelings and clan friends. Each of the great houses has developed their own subcultures with varying practices, motivations, and unique aesthetics. Morrowind itself is ultimately ruled by the Grand Council, which is made up of councillors from the Great Houses, House Redoran, House Telvani, House Inderil, House Dress, and previously House Lalu, but in the fourth era they lost their seat to the newcomer, House Sadras. At first glance, this may seem like a well-structured system of governance, one overarching authority, comprised of representatives from each of the houses, as well as the reigning King of Morrowind, but if it were this simple and the Grand Council cooperated harmoniously on all matters, well, we wouldn't have a great deal to discuss. But in reality, the Dunma, as well as the Kaima before them, are mortals just like every other Tamrielic race. They are susceptible to corruption, greed, and deception. No form of governance is immune to political machinations, and a politician who values good policy over personal ambition is likely the best liar of the bunch. And this is accepting the fact that the Kaima established their society in accordance with Mafala's guidance. If mortals devoted to the divines are prone to vice, just imagine how the web spinner's acolytes would turn out. The good Daedra, led by Boethia, exposed the lies of the Aedra and denounced Trinimac as the biggest liar of all, saying so with Trinimac's own voice. This brazen act emboldened the Gavad Aldma. With Mafala, he showed them the triangled truth. This select group of elves were made privy to the rules of the Sijic Endeavor, the notion that mortality is a test, designed by the missing god to be overcome. Everything from architecture to physical appearance, from worship to governance, and Mafala took a special interest in their politics. Mafala, in her immortality, knows power. She knows power like a lover. She knows how to present herself, what to say and what to do in order to have her way with power. It is no accident that her sphere encompasses sex, lies, and murder, as they all go hand in hand. These concepts are what complicate mortal affairs. They embroil emotion and ambition. They are the strands in her impossibly complex web. So when Mafala imparted her secret arts upon the Kaima, the political landscape was forever changed. She taught them the skills needed to evade their enemies, or to kill them with secret murder. In those early days, enemies were abundant, and the changed ones were few. But with deceptions like sex and assassination, the Kaima were always one step ahead of their adversaries. With Mafala's covert tactics, and Boethia's unrivaled ability to overcome all obstacles, the Kaima built a society shaped by Daedric principles. The clan systems evolved into the Great Houses, and these houses persist to the present day. Unprecedented customs naturally emerged in this new nation, like the Morag Tong. These assassins may seem like your run-of-the-mill killers for hire, but Morag Tong assassins actually played a key role in defining the political landscape. 
Government-sanctioned assassinations were totally legal, and by using the writ system, a councillor could rid themselves of political rivals. To avoid all-out house warfare, an unusual custom allowed one great house or individual member to challenge the honour of another great house member. A ranking noble challenged this way would become marked for death. If within a year the individual marked for death remained alive, the challenging house were publicly obliged to forego any further complaints on the matter. With these customs in place, petty feuds could be settled officially, without disrupting the peace and the rule of law. This marriage of deception and assassination, with public knowledge, is unique to the Dunma, and such customs are considered alien beyond Morrowind's borders. The many regions of Morrowind were each ruled by a house, which in turn was comprised of the clans and tribes dwelling in the vicinity. House Redoran laid claim to the northwest in the narrow strip of land bordering Skyrim. House Telvani operated in the east. House Inderil held the centre of Morrowind. House Dress occupied the fertile southern plains, stretching as far as the border with Black Marsh. House Hlalu's district was located in the central west, before being stripped of their holdings and replaced by the rising House Sadras. Membership within a great house largely came down to location of birth and circumstances of marriage. It is possible for imperial colonists to be adopted into a great house, but this is a rare occurrence. For an outlander to warrant a place within a great house, they must show exceptional character and loyalty. This begins with an oath bond, promising exclusive loyalty to the house in question. After faithful service has been displayed, the outlander may advance the ranks and seek a house member's sponsorship for adoption. While proximity played a key role in the establishing of the Great Houses, this is by no means the only distinguishing factor. Aside from the inevitable rivalry that forms among political factions, the diverse landscape of Morrowind combined with the attitudes of prominent members over the centuries has transformed these houses. And now you'd have more trouble finding similarities than you would differences. A Redoran is a warrior whose duty is first to the tribunal, second to House Redoran, and third to family and clan. This is the motto of House Redoran. From the city of Blacklight, House Redoran ruled the northwestern lands of Morrowind, flanked by the inner sea to the east and the Velothi Mountains to the west. House Redoran prizes the virtues of duty, gravity, and piety. Duty is to one's own honor and to one's family and clan. Gravity is the essential seriousness of life. Life is hard and events must be judged, endured, and reflected upon with due care and earnestness. Piety is respect for the gods and the virtues they represent. A light, careless life is not worth living. Members of House Redoran hold true to the ancient lessons of Boethia. They value bravery in battle and revere the way of the warrior. There is no doubt at all that their location has facilitated these values. The Nords of Skyrim are their closest neighbours as the bird flies, and the humans have a reputation for aggressive conquest. Protecting Greater Morrowind from the threats that emerge over the Velothi Peaks has hardened this house, and they have endured the test of time, becoming arguably the most influential of all the Great Houses. And of all the Great Houses, House Redoran seems to have strayed from Mafala's secret arts the most. Murder is not taken lightly, and honesty is valued dearly. A Redoran noble must know the virtue of gravity. It is not the Redoran way to laugh at serious matters, for it shows disrespect. It is not the Redoran way to spread rumours, for they fester and breed dissension. Mafala would be displeased to see her disciples turn their backs on rumours, for deception is her dagger. As befits their description so far, House Redoran employs practicality and austerity when designing settlements. They favour local materials with organic curves and unadorned exteriors. Redoran villages are well planned and focused around central plazas, and their architecture takes inspiration from the landscape and the shells of giant native insects. Due to their prized virtues, members of House Redoran tend to be as cosmopolitan as Dark Elves are capable of being. They respect martial prowess, and that endears the Imperial Legion and Fighters Guild to them. These virtues culminated in House Redoran taking charge when the Oblivion Crisis began. The Empire withdrew their legions in the interest of protecting their homeland, and Morrowind was left exposed. With no standing national army and the ruination of the Redoran city of Aldrun, the Great House took it upon themselves to muster an army. Despite their efforts, the crisis was still devastating, but it would certainly have been far worse had House Redoran not taken the initiative. It was yet another Redoran representative who acted when the next catastrophe came. Red Mountain erupted five years later, and the Redoran councillor living in Mournhold coordinated the relief effort in Vardenfell. 
Fortunately, the location of Redoran territory combined with their military might prevented the ensuing Argonian invasion from progressing further into the northwest. Not all of the houses would be so well prepared. The power vacuum left in the wake of these consecutive calamities allowed House Redoran to excel, and as of the modern day, Blacklight is the capital city of Morrowind. The forceful expression of will gives true honour to the ancestors. So reads the motto of House Telvanni. Iconoclastic, profane and unconventional, House Telvanni matches the disposition of Sofa Sil. The wizard lords of House Telvanni couldn't be any more different to House Redoran. Piety and duty take a backseat to the pursuit of knowledge. To the Telvanni, wisdom confers power, and power confers right. Therefore, the most intelligent are inherently correct when engaged in political discussions and matters of law. This leads to interesting results when members of House Telvanni propose controversial ideals, such as the ancient Dunmeri right to own slaves. Telvanni ports and cities run on slave labour, and slave markets are held frequently. The wizard lords of House Telvanni have traditionally isolated themselves, pursuing wisdom and mastery in solitude. This element of Telvanni society has bred a culture of individualism. Prominent members of House Telvanni spend a great deal of time within their mushroom towers, carrying out experiments, seeking answers to Tamriel's greatest questions, and nothing comes between a Telvanni wizard and their research. A good example of Telvanni attitudes can be seen within their towers, where you'll rarely find stairs. If you wish to ascend the tower, you must master levitation magic. You can imagine how representatives of House Telvanni on the Grand Council act in meetings. They aren't interested in the goings-on across the continent, nor the trivial concerns of the other houses and guilds. If House Telvanni expends the effort to attend a council meeting in the first place, it is likely to denounce the abolitionists, or the pathetic imperial mages guild which the Empire is so adamantly thrusting upon foreign lands. To rise through the ranks as a Telvanni, you need to be highly egocentric and zealous. You will need to eliminate competition and even dispose of rival wizards. You won't see members of House Telvanni prioritizing duty to one's clan over individual ambition. During the interregnum of the Second Era, when the precarious alliance between the Nords, Argonians and Dunmer was forged, House Telvanni refused to join. And considering their opinions on slavery and beast folk in general, that makes total sense. When the Regia came, the Argonian invaders focused on wiping out House Telvanni. They had been weakened by the Oblivion Crisis, and many believe House Telvanni was wiped out entirely. While little is known about the current state of the house, certainly not enough to confirm these claims, we can see one major Telvanni settlement that remains in the present day on the coast of Solstheim, where Nelof resides in his newly grown tower, Tel Mifrin. Justice knows no sleep. Indoril shall order, the temple shall judge. If you've seen the iconic Indoril armor, worn by the Ordinators, a militant order serving the tribunal across Morrowind, then you know of House Indoril. The Indoril are orthodox and conservative supporters of the temple and temple authority. House Indoril is openly hostile to imperial culture and religion, and preserves many traditional Dunma customs and practices in defiance of imperial law. Scorn for imperial influence in Morrowind is not a rare sentiment, and few hate it more than the great house of Indoril Nerevar. House Indoril operate in the very heart of the province, and governed Morrowind's historic capital city of Almalexia or Mournhold as it was known before and after the reign of the Tribunal. Vivek says this about giving Morrowind's capital city to House Indoril. To my sister brother's city I give the holy protection of House Indoril, whose powers and thrones know no equal under heaven, wherefrom came the Hortator. Hortator being the name given to a member of a great house elected to lead the entire nation in times of extreme crisis. The namesake for Great House Indoril, General Indoril Nerevar, being the most famous of these Hortators. As Vivek's statement suggests, House Indoril has always been closely linked with the Tribunal Temple, and the Indoril Militant Order, the Ordinators, protect all temple holdings, uphold temple law, and devote their lives to Alm Sivi. Indoril territory stretches as far as Tamriel's east coast, and Necrom, the city of the dead, lies within their domain. During the Second Era, in the year 896, when Vivek signed an armistice with Tiber Septim of the Empire, many leading figures in House Indoril were outraged and swore to resist imperial rule, even if it meant committing suicide to avoid cooperation. 
Two fundamental traits of House Inderil were put at odds when the armistice was signed. They were dedicated to the tribunal, and thus Vivek's deeds, yet they were also historically hostile to imperial culture and religion. When the Lord High Chancellor of the Grand Council, a member of House Inderil, rejected Vivek's treaty, he was soon assassinated replaced by a member of House Hlalu. The subsequent feuds between Indril and Hlalu left the former house severely weakened. Far from their former glory, the remaining members of House Indril avoided brash actions and resigned themselves to upholding the status quo, focusing their attention on protecting Morrowind from the growing threat of Dagoth Ur and Red Mountain. The remainder of House Indril's power was tied to the Tribunal Temple, and when that collapsed, ushering in the age of the new temple, House Indril was in ruins. To spread culture and truth to the benighted, this is our commitment and burden. The motto of House Dress implies a noble cause, and if you ask a member, they'd attest to the righteousness of this cause. However, the chains displayed on their sigil seem to contradict this notion. Whatever your presuppositions may be regarding House Dress, there's no denying the clan's astute business acumen. House Dress is an agrarian agricultural society, and its large salt rice plantations rely completely on slave labor for their economic viability. Always firm temple supporters, House Dress is hostile to imperial law and culture, and in particular opposed to any attempts to limit the institution of slavery. Much like House Inderil, the Southern House Dress despise imperial influence in their holdings. And can you blame them? The cosmopolitan imperials of Cyrodiil are firmly in favor of abolishing slavery Tamriel wide. Members of House Dress could not care less about the appraising eyes of outlanders. They are traditional. They represent the past of pre-tribunal Great House culture culture, a persistent tradition of Daedra and ancestor worship. And it just so happens that the exploitation of enslaved beast folk is well accepted in traditional Dunmary culture. In southeastern Morrowind, on the fertile soil of the Dashan Plain, salt rice crops can be cultivated year-round, and in the mines, Kwama can be bred for their eggs. How stressed were fortunate to find their holdings in these fecund lands. Despite being a rural society, wealth was abundant in dress territory, and the income generated by their high-yielding crops was supported by their next biggest export, slaves. With Black Marsh on their border, plantation owners could freely raid the lands to the south and harvest this valuable commodity. The Argonians were not as well organized as their northern neighbors, and while many would have put up a fight, members of House Dress gained far more than they lost in this endeavor. Those slaves who weren't busy working the fields were cooped up in slave pens all over the region, awaiting the next slave ship to Port Telvanis, or wherever else slaves were in demand. You'd think the series of cataclysms shaking Morrowind at the turn of the era might have been kinder to House Dress. Their lands are far to the south of Red Mountain after all, but the tremors sent through the province devastated the region, and the fertile soil turned to swamp. The sudden submergence of the land actually caused the southern wall of the dress capital city Tyr to collapse, and unsurprisingly when the Argonians enacted their revenge, House Dress were most heavily affected. The forces of Argonia ravaged southern Morrowind, and destroying their former slave masters was sweet catharsis to the lizard folk. Morrowind has long been a controversial province as far as Greater Tamriel is concerned. The Dunma have their own customs and values, many of which directly oppose the cosmopolitan globalist goals of the Empire. Most of the Great Houses oppose outlanders in some capacity, with houses Inderil and Dress among the staunchest. Thus, when a Great House emerges, who welcome Imperial influence, trouble was inevitable. Behold the opportunistic House Lalu of Narsis. As a result of its close relationship with the Imperial administration, House Lalu has emerged as politically and economically dominant among the Great Houses of Vardenfell and Morrowind. Hlalu welcomes imperial culture and law, imperial legions and bureaucracy, and imperial freedom of trade and religion. Hlalu still honors the old Dunma ways, the ancestors, the temple, and the noble houses, but has readily adapted to the rapid pace of change and progress in the imperial provinces. Maintaining a link to the past doesn't make up for the fact they embrace change, at least as far as the other houses are concerned. Hlalu members are renowned for their business sense and diplomatic abilities, and this no doubt comes into play when analyzing their willingness to support the Cyrodiilic Empire. It seems likely that House Hlalu picked a Nyx Hound and put all their gold behind it. They saw the potential of the Imperials, and trusted the fact that supporting the foreign faction might help them attain more power for themselves. This much is suggested in the book Grasping Fortune by Sergio Hlalu Drambero, which states, In the great wind of progress, tradition cannot stand. 
grasp fortune by the forelocks. When you see your chances, seize them. When you see a chance to turn a profit, take it. House Lalu did exactly that, and it worked. The house rose from obscurity to become a prominent house. When Vivek and Talos signed their armistice, House Lalu benefited greatly. But just as their support for the Empire had made them, it would also unmake them. When the Oblivion Crisis struck Tamriel, the Empire withdrew their legions from Morrowind. Anti-Imperial sentiments surged as a result. This set in motion House Lalu's downfall. In the words of Adril Arano, the second counselor of Redoran-controlled Ravenrock, their collaboration with the Empire may have given them unrivaled political and economic strength, but their hearts weren't with the Dunma people. House Lalu had committed to their gambit, and it had provided dividends for a while. But by the present day, it had destroyed them. Hlalu became the scapegoat for Dunma dissatisfaction, and they were unceremoniously stripped of their great house status. This saw House Redoran take over as Morrowind's eminent power. House Hlalu was replaced by a previously obscure faction, Great House Sadras. Their mark on Morrowind's political landscape is yet to be written into the Annals. Over Morrowind's history, there have been other houses, most of which we only know a small amount about. But a few deserve a mention, like House Duema, which existed during the time of the First Council. Of course, this house is for the Dwarven clans living in Resdane during the First Era and came about to represent the Chimer accepting the Dwarves into their culture. There was House Sofa, though the only known members include the demigod Sofa Sil and his sister Sofa Nal. House Sofa operated in the settlement of Ald Sofa, though it was utterly destroyed early in the First Era by Mehrunes Dagon. Finally, there is the great house the Dunma prefer not to speak of, and that is House Dagoth. Pity Dagoth Ur and the Sixth House. All they do, all they are, is foul and evil, but they began in brightness and honour, and the cause of their fall was their loyal service to you, Lord Nerevar. Led by Lord Vorin Dagoth, all records of the once great house have been purged from Morrowind. The only trace of them that couldn't be entirely wiped from the histories is the fate of the house's leader. For the full story of Dagoth Ur, the Sharmat, check out the link in the description. It seems as though House Dagoth had an affinity for music, and sound in general. All the old shrines in honour of the house feature sets of large bells or chimes, and even some forms of ash creatures have trunk-like growths, which may have been used like musical instruments. Perhaps Vorin Dagoth's affinity for music is what appealed to him about the Dwemer and the heart of Lorcan. The tonal architects used sound to uncover the wonders of the universe, and their chief aimed to use his tools to strike the heart of Lorcan like a doom drum, producing the perfect volume and quality of power from the beating heart. A fictional epic on the legacy of the dead Sixth House suggests that the descendants of House Dagoth, who were absorbed into the other houses and assimilated into their cultures, can still hear the songs of their ancestors. But with that, we come to the end of the Great Houses of Morrowind. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching. I've been Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.